I can remember walking on patrol one night. And this was like in the evening. And I was coming down this rice paddy and uh, a huge water buffalo stepped out and faced me. I just happened to be on the point of the patrol and everybody else was behind me at the time. So I'm standing there looking at this huge water buffalo and the water buffalo decides that he doesn't like me and he starts pounding on the ground with his huge hoof but I wasn't too much afraid of the water buffalo. You see, I was armed. What did scare me, though, was the fact that everybody behind me put a round in the chamber. And so I was standing there facing this wild buffalo, and all these guys standing behind me had loaded their rifles. And I thought they were going to shoot through me to hit the water buffalo. Uh, so I was more afraid of what they were going to do than what this water buffalo had mine to do. When all of a sudden, out comes this little kid, grabs the water buffalo, and takes him away. Well, that taught me a lesson. I looked back at those guys. And, uh, yeah, we had a big laugh about that. Now, when we got back off patrol, a lot of times we'd um, go in while it was still dark, you know, go back to our uh, area, and uh, sometimes it was like on top of a hill. We'd go out several clicks, come around, and come back in. Well, the VC had a uh, habit of attaching onto our patrol and walking in right behind us. So what we would do is the first guy, or the second guy, whatever, um, usually the squad leader, would step aside and count heads as they went past. You see, it was dark, and sometimes you just couldn't tell the um, enemy from the Marines. You just had to count heads. So it was on one of these patrols. I had stepped aside, and I stepped into this bush, and I started counting heads of all these Marines that were passing me that had been on patrol. And I noticed something right away. I had stepped into an anthill of fire ants. Now, these aren't just your normal, everyday, garden-variety fire ants. These are Vietnamese fire ants, and they ate my butt. I couldn't make a noise. I couldn't move. I had to stay where I was, or my own guys could have shot me. And I had to just grin and bear it. Well, speaking about mean critters in Vietnam, I'd like to say a couple of words about... Uh, some other guys I ran across. You know, going on patrol in the jungle uh, was not glamorous or, or something desirable. It was triple thick canopy jungle and you stayed wet 90% of the time, uh, either by the rain or simply walking through a lot of creeks that Sometimes it was over your head. But one of the guys that I ran across a lot were leeches. Now, leeches would get on you, and a lot of times you wouldn't even know they were there. And you'd feel this little lump, and they'd swell up. Sometimes it would itch. And uh, the only way you'd get them off is uh, sometimes with a, a, a cigarette burn them off, but I've got some information for anybody that uh, wants to destroy a leech. Please do not try to put a leech down on a rock and stamp on it. I did that and about uh, hurt myself. You see, those things are kind of like, oh, 
step on a slick piece of hard rubber. Uh, you can't kill them by stamping on them. Uh, they're they're thick or about as big around as your finger. And um, the best thing to do is just get them off you and throw them away. Another critter I had uh, the misfortune to uh, meet in Vietnam uh, were rats. Now, rats in Vietnam sometimes were as big as little dogs here in the state. One time, I was sitting by uh, the trash dump there, headquarters 2-4, while we were still on the other side of the tracks. I was writing a letter home, and I saw this rat in the trash. And without thinking about it, I drew my K-bar, flipped it in the air, caught the blade, threw the K-bar at the rat, and stuck it perfectly, killing it instantly. Then I went back to writing my letter like I do this sort of thing every day. It just so happened that the uh, Tung Wee Lich, who was our interpreter, saw uh, what I did, and he walked over and pulled the knife out and gave it back to me and said, wow, <laughs> I probably couldn't have done that in the next 100 years. Now, there was another time that I was uh, uh, laying in my rack in the tent, and uh, Don Johnson was sitting in his rack. It was right next to mine, and I felt something moving on my back. And I had a blanket over me and no shirt on, and I thought it was a spider. But I told John, I said, John, when I roll away, you killed the spider. And he said, okay. So he got something in his hand. I don't know, it was rolled up paper or something like that. Something you'd kill a, an insect with. And I felt this thing and it just moved off my back and I rolled out of the way and looked up and I saw Don Johnson and he had stood up and froze in a position of uh, where he had his arm in the air ready to strike this thing, but he froze and stopped and his eyes got real big. I looked at my rack and there it was, a huge rat. Well, the rat looked up at John and looked over at me and just walked off, uh, jumped off the edge of my rack and left the tent. Well, there were a lot more uh, critters than those like spiders and snakes and bats, monkeys and all kinds of weird things out there. And I ran across most of them. Now once we were told that uh, because of the fact that we went on patrol around the Ho Chi Minh Trail and uh, in the mountains and throughout the jungle, um, we were supposed to be on the lookout for tigers. And the reason why was because uh, we found out that a, an Army Special Forces soldier was almost eaten by one, and uh, he managed to kill it. Uh, I met this same fellow a few years later, and he told me that what happened was they were on an ambush, and he was laying down, he felt something tug at his leg. And he, he said that, uh, you know, he, he thought it was another uh, soldier uh, that was close to him. And then he turned around and looked, and he saw this gigantic tiger who had grabbed onto his pant leg and was pulling him out of the area. And, uh, of course, he turned around and, unloaded everything he had on this tiger, killed it. But that's the kind of jungle that we were in. Oh, we also ran across uh, elephants. I was going to tell you about that later, yeah. Operation Double Eagle. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I'd like to tell you about some other guys that were uh, later assigned to the Raider Platoon. 
one of them in particular, he was the last guy I had in my squad. And I think I called him New York because uh, that's where he was from. He was a college kind of kid and had never been to Vietnam. How he got in the Raiders, I don't know. Anyway, this guy was kind of green. And uh, the first patrol I took him on, I gave him an M79. Now, an M79 uh, is probably, the M79 man has probably the safest position on the patrol, uh, you know, behind the radio man and the, the squad leader, who was me, and um, kind of kept an eye on him. Well, he decided to load the M79. Now, you're not really supposed to load this thing until you're ready to use it. And on an M79, the trigger guard has a little clip that you can actually push the trigger guard out of the way uh, to expose the trigger. And I guess that's, they did that uh, for guys that wear gloves. Anyway, he decided to play with his M79 while we're on patrol. He pushed the trigger guard aside. Of course, it was loaded. Then he held it like a shotgun and hitting the trigger, the M79 went off and the round from the M79 bounced along the trail that we were on and landed right next to me. Now, an M79 round is not supposed to detonate. It doesn't charge until it's like, I think, oh, if I remember right, four foot uh, away from the end of the barrel. This thing hit the ground, uh, not, uh, oh, two feet away and just just bounced along the trail. It didn't go off, thank God, or I wouldn't be making this um, little video that I'm making right now. Now, that was one time. Then there was another time. The same guy was in a bunker, and he was in the bunker next to my bunker. And my bunker was, you know, away from him, and we heard something on the wire, and we hit a pop-up flare, and he hit his pop-up flare, but he aimed it in the wrong direction, and that pop-up flare ended up in my bunker. Well, the same guy, uh, during Operation Double Eagle, walked over to me, tapped me on the shoulder, and said in a quiet voice, I think there's a grenade over there. Of course, I hollered grenade because that's what you're supposed to do, and everybody got down and it went off. Fortunately, nobody was hit. And yeah, it was a chai com that some um, Viet Cong had thrown at us. And I got real mad at this guy because I told him, you're supposed to holler grenade so we can get down, not just come over and tell me you think there, there's one over there. Uh, I said a few things to him. You know, later on, that guy became a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps. Well, another little interesting fact that a lot of people don't know. Uh, I know that uh, there have been pictures of soldiers and Marines uh, with a um, ace of spades stuck in their helmets. And uh, a lot of Folks don't realize why, what's significant about that. You see, we learned early on that the Viet Cong were very, very superstitious. And uh, this, I guess, came from the uh, Vietnamese themselves who told us that if you come across a dead VC, and you put the ace of spades in his mouth or somewhere close by on his body, that when his comrades come to get him, uh, they will be very afraid. Uh, had something to do with the afterlife and their superstition. So we all started carrying the ace of spades. And that was the reason. It was a kind of a psychological warfare that we were dealing with and we dealt with throughout Vietnam. Anything that we could find out about the enemy, 
and what they believed and what they thought that we could use against them, we did. I think it was sometime in October, a friend of mine and I got separated from the rest of the squad and we were on a hunter killer patrol trying to gather as much intelligence as we could. And uh, when we came across a, a large um, body of Viet Cong that were slyly moving down this trail, um, my buddy and I got down in this bush close to the trail and there were a lot of VC. So we just stayed there in one spot. We saw the chopper come down on the hill that we were supposed to be picked up on. And uh, we watched them take off with the rest of our squad. We stayed there all night. The next morning, the VC had moved down the trail and it looked like the end of the unit. So we got up out of the bush, ran across the trail and up this side of this mountain when we saw two more come out. I think they're what they were called as a connecting file. You see there was a large group of VC and then two and then another large group behind them. When we saw those two, we shot at them and continued to run up the side of the hill. Got up to the top and ran down the other side. And as we uh, came down into the um, this rice paddy area, we saw the Marines off in the distance and that was, I think, part of Echo Company. Uh, Echo Company had gone out looking for us. Of course, when we finally made it to Echo Company, uh, we were able to call in uh, close air support and they found the enemy that uh, we had seen the night before. Well, we didn't uh, stick with Echo Company. They went uh, across that mountain to, I guess, count the bodies of what uh, the Phantoms had taken care of. And we continued on. I knew where Route 1 was, so we made our way to Route 1 and caught a ride on an Amtrak and made it all the way back to the uh, CP area. At that time, we were on the beach. And as soon as I got to our area, uh, the Marines that uh, were in my squad saw me and they were real happy to see me, but their morale was kind of low. And I said, what happened? Well, we had a new platoon sergeant. He had just taken over as a platoon sergeant of the Raider platoon. And he was a uh, I think a staff sergeant or gunnery sergeant, I can't remember at the time. But uh, at any rate, we were told, uh, my buddy and I, that uh, he wanted to see us right now. So we went to the staff NCO tent, and that was the first time I ran into this sergeant. He started to chew me out, uh, told me that we were missing an action, and it was a uh, telegram sent to our parents and the major wanted to see us right now at the S2 tent. So we didn't say a whole lot to this fella. Oh, by the way, we came to find out that uh, the reason why the morale was low uh, among the scouts and the raiders was because this guy had given our beer ration, which we got like two beers a day, to the officers. Well, we were marched down to the S2 tent when the major saw us. He came out and started to um, smile and uh, ran over to us and said, Darrow, oh, I'm glad to see you. You did a great job. And then he proceeded to tell us that uh, we had um, called in airstrikes on a large number of VC who they were then counting the bodies of. And he proceeded to say that we had done a really fine job. And, uh, 
Then that sergeant that chewed us out turned to the major and he said, yes, sir, I was just telling them what a fine job they had done. That's when I knew we were in serious trouble. The major asked me, he said, what can I do for you? And I told the major about the beer ration and I asked him if my Marines could come back and get their beer. He said, oh, absolutely, it's stored right over there. And he pointed to the location. I just looked at that sergeant, didn't say anything to him. Went back to the tent and I sent the Marines back to get their beer. Well, that was the first time that uh, our paths crossed. Shortly thereafter, we went on a few patrols and then something odd happened. We were sent to this village my squad, my 10-man squad, the corpsman, and this sergeant, who was a platoon sergeant at the time. And we were called uh, a CAP group, Combined Action Program. We were supposed to go live in the Ville and win the minds and hearts of the people. Uh, that's all we knew. <laughs> we, we didn't have any... Uh, any other direction outside of the fact that we were supposed to work with the popular forces in the village. The popular forces was kind of like a, an army reserve unit. We went to this village as the uh, CAP group and uh, lived there for a couple of weeks. One of the things that happened was kind of funny. The village chief invited me to uh, have dinner with him and his family. So Don Johnson and I decided we were going to go, you know, accept the invitation. Went to the village hut. And we were sitting there and the uh, chief came out and he was all happy and uh, placed in front of us this thing that we that kind of looked like a... Uh, a coaster, you know, you put your glass on, it was made of rice, and it was real fancy, it was stamped, pretty. And uh, we were told to eat it. Well, I took a bite of this thing, and I looked at Don Johnson, and he looked at me, and he bit down on it. And we both agreed that this was the worst tasting concoction of, I don't know what, that we had ever put in our mouths. But we smiled and shook our heads and thanked the chief for his uh, allowing us to have dinner with him and his family. Of course, all the kids in the village were standing around looking at us, and they laughed to this day. I don't know if we were supposed to eat that or put something on it. There was another thing that happened that wasn't so funny. Uh, well, the first day we got there, one of my Marines came up to me and he said, uh, that uh, PF over there stole my poncho. I said, he stole your poncho. He said, yeah, he just came over and took it. And uh, so I went over to the uh, um, lieutenant in charge of the PFs and I told him, I said, uh, one of your men just stole a poncho from one of my men. Well, this lieutenant, I'll never forget him. He went over and grabbed that poor young Vietnamese popular forces private and smacked him around, then pulled a forty-five, and I thought for sure he was going to shoot him. And you know, he would have. And I stepped in and said, hey, wait a minute, let him keep the poncho. We'll get another poncho. And uh, this lieutenant let me know in no uncertain terms that uh, they will not put up with anybody stealing from us. And uh, it, it took me a while to talk him out of uh, shooting this guy. But he ended up not shooting him. And uh, the... Uh, young Vietnamese gave the poncho back to my man. And I was glad to see that. 
Now, one of the things that we did with the popular forces in that village was go on patrol with them. I was uh, with them uh, one time, and we were going into this other village, and I had knelt down on a rice paddy. I was like the point. I knelt down and looked into this village, and two of the popular forces ran around me and up to this uh, gate. It was made out of bamboo. One of them opened the gate, and the gate blew up and killed both of them. And a piece of bamboo from that gate flipped through the air and hit me right in the middle of my forehead. Knocked me down. Well, I got up. I was fine uh, outside of getting knocked down by that little piece of bamboo. I didn't think that, you know, it was hurt all that bad. Uh, so I got up and uh, we went through that village. Uh, nothing else happened. Got all the way to the other side. And somebody said, Bill, you're bleeding. I reached up. I thought I was sweating. And I reached up and felt a large gash in my forehead. Well, it didn't hurt at all. You know, it's kind of numb, as a matter of fact. But there was a large gash up there, so I took my T-shirt and I wrapped my head. And it was kind of like, I, I felt like a Revolutionary War soldier. I, I know you've seen pictures of a Revolutionary War soldier, you know, marching, playing the drum and the flute. And he's got his head wrapped uh, in a bandage. That's kind of how I felt. Well, I got back to the uh, area where we were staying, and the uh, corpsman who was with us wanted to write me up for a Purple Heart. Well, just like in the trang the first time, I told the corpsman, please do not write me up for a Purple Heart because I didn't want my parents to worry about me. You see, my father had had heart troubles, and I, I was worried that if he got another telegram like he did when I was missing in action, it would not be good. So I made the corpsman swear he would not write me up for a purple heart. But I'll tell you, to this day, you can see that beautiful scar I got in the middle of my forehead from being hit by that piece of bamboo. Oh, we stayed in the Ville for a few weeks. Then we were back on our routine patrols. Now, short range patrol was like, you know, maybe overnight. And long range patrols were all about four days. Two days out, two days back. Now, that's a lot of chow to carry when you think about it. And sometimes we ran out of chow. But uh, there was just uh, this one occasion I remember I was called to the CP tent just before we left to go on one of these four-day patrols. And I was asked if uh, I'd be willing to take along a woman reporter. Well, I immediately said, no, sir, unless I absolutely have to, because we were going into Indian country. We were heading for oh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail and jungles around it. And I didn't think that uh, it was uh, very safe to take a woman out on. So um, from what I understand, she went with golf company on what we used to call a backyard patrol. That was a patrol that was close to the airstrip there at Chulai, uh, down Route 1 in the southern part, N not too long just a, a day or so out. So I went on the patrol, and when we got back, I learned that this woman reporter had stepped on a booby trap and got killed. I learned that from uh, the chaplain, uh, McNamara, who was uh, at that time the uh, chaplain for 2-4. Like I said, I... Uh, my best buddy was um, 
a chaplain's assistant. Now, this wasn't the same chaplain we started out with. Uh, this was a different one, but still in all, I really like this guy. He told me that the woman reporter got killed. It wasn't until now, just a few weeks ago, that I learned who this woman was. Her name was Dicky Chappelle. She was a very, very famous war correspondent and uh, photographer who loved the Marines. Uh, I felt pretty bad about not taking her on patrol because nothing happened where I was, even though it was deep in the jungle. But there is no place safe in Vietnam, especially in those days. Well, shortly after that, we continued to patrol the area. And one time, our sergeant, the one I told you about that had taken over the Raider Battalion, uh, was told to go on patrol with us. You see, most of the time, he didn't go on patrol. He just sent us. So finally, they decided to send him. So he took two squads, first and second squad, my squad and another squad. And we went out on patrol just a couple days. We got hit by uh, one sniper who didn't hurt anybody. He just shot in our direction. Well, this sergeant kind of panicked a little bit and he called in support. Well, yeah, this was during the daylight, and we got down behind a rice paddy, and I sent a couple Marines around to take care of the sniper, which they did. Next thing I knew, we had this helicopter uh, that landed at our position, and they threw out more ammunition than we could carry. Of course, what we needed was chow, but they didn't have any of that. The sergeant jumped on the chopper, looked at me and said, you're in charge. And he left and went back to the CP. Well, after that patrol, when we got back, I learned that uh, he, he had rotated back to the States, which was a good thing. And uh, we had a new platoon sergeant. Then a friend of mine who worked in the CP typing up things, told me that this sergeant had come in and and put a piece of paper in the typewriter and wrote himself up for a bronze star. That was rather unusual, but I was kind of glad to see him gone. Anyway, we continued to go on patrols. Well, once uh, we went through this village and uh, the village chief came out and said, no VC, no VC. So I broke the squad up into two units. Don Johnson was in charge of half a squad, and I took the other half and uh, set up an ambush by a uh, cemetery that was right outside the ville. And John took the other half of the squad and started to move uh, through the village to the other end. And we thought that anything, you know, might come our way uh, would have to come through that area. So uh, after I had set up and we'd been there a little while, all of a sudden I heard gunfire and it was an M14 on full automatic. It was coming from John's position. So I got on the radio to find out what happened. Of course, we were setting up an ambush and uh, you know, you don't leave your ambush. And I was told that they had one Ford and one Cadillac. Now a Ford was a code word for a uh, dead VC. A Cadillac was a code word for a wounded Marine. 
and I asked who the wounded Marine was, and it came back, Don Johnson. Well, that night, uh, like I say, I couldn't move. I got very upset. I took out my K-bar, and I was going to go back and have a conversation with that village chief who told us that there were no VC in the area. My radio man had to sit on me literally all night so that I wouldn't leave. And when the first light hit, we broke up the ambush and I went as fast as I could to the area where I knew John was. When I finally arrived at his position, there was Don Johnson sitting there drinking a beer and laughing. He had been shot in his head, but it was just nicked his right eye. The funny thing about that was, if there was anything funny about it, that uh, he had been shot there once before in the same spot, just nicked his right eye. Well, what happened was a VC jumped up in front of him and he cut that guy in half, literally, with his M14. I was glad to see that he wasn't hurt any worse than he was. And we had not lost any Marines and killed one VC. We had a another uh, incident where John and I were together again. We were coming back off patrol. We, it, it was like a long-range patrol, but uh, we had almost made it all the way back. And a little girl ran out on the trail in front of us, and she pointed to the village, and she said, VC, VC, and then she darted out of the way. Well, I got the squad down, and we looked in through the village, and I saw this guy sitting in a tree, and he was facing away from us, and his his feet were dangling like over a branch. So I started to aim in, and John started to aim in at the same time. Well, we're sitting next to each other, and Tom Johnson said, he's mine. And I said, well, I saw him first. And John said, but he's mine. I said, no, he's mine. So we started arguing about who was going to shoot this guy out of a tree. What we wanted to do was just wound him and try to gather some information, you know, uh, interrogate him, take him prisoner. So <laughs> I decided that uh, since I was a squad leader, it was uh, my turn to shoot this guy. And John said, okay, but if you miss, I'm going to get him. I said, okay, it's a deal. Well, I aimed in and I fired two rounds rapid succession bang bang well the first round hit this guy behind his knee and he flipped backward out of the tree and the second round caught him right in the chest under his chin so we went into the ville and uh, I had my picture taken with this guy and the village chief came out and presented me with a Viet Vietnamese flag. Well, then we were told that 200 of them had just left the village, and this guy was a lookout, the one I'd shot out of a tree. We were also told that the day before, these Viet Cong had moved into the village and demanded rice and other things that the village uh, chief and the uh, people of the village refused to supply. Well, these VC started with a baby of this one family, and they killed the whole family, starting from the youngest to the oldest. And that's the way these VC operated. Now in Vietnam, there were a few very nice ancient temples, small ones, usually around a graveyard. 
and we had come up upon one of these small temples out in the middle of the bush and we could hear this monk this Buddhist monk chanting so I snuck up to the edge of this temple looked inside and I saw a Buddhist monk uh, chanting in front of a dead body that was laid out and uh, there were candles inside it was also a large statue of Buddha with a big fat belly who just happened to be in this temple well I waited a while and the monk finally left and I snuck into the uh, temple looking for anything that might be around this dead body like weapons or grenades or whatever I didn't see anything and then this thought struck me I looked at this big Buddhist statue and I decided to leave my mark so I took my k-bar out and I scratched a big D with an arrow through it see that's my name Darrow and it's spelled D-A-R-R-O-W. So my mark was like a D, looked like a bow, with an arrow through it. And that just happened to be on the belly of this big Buddha. Well, I wondered to this day what that monk thought when he went back in there and saw that D carved in his favorite Buddha. Now, you'd think that the Marines had learned a long time ago not to... Uh, hang hang grenades well not this one marine he had a grenade hung from his cartridge belt the only problem was the grenade had come a little unscrewed and it was bent it had bent from the pin down into the grenade <laughs> so I got everybody down and I told this Marine to just freeze, don't move. Took the grenade off of his belt, finished unscrewing it from the uh, blasting cap, pulled it gingerly out of the grenade and made it inert. Now had that thing gone off, I wouldn't be making this recording right now. In December of 1965, I participated in Operation Harvest Moon. We were heloed out to an area north of Chulai, and uh, there were several uh, units involved in this operation. <clears throat> it wasn't anything like uh, Starlight had been, uh, but we did um, run into resistance. There were uh, units of VC and NVA in the area, uh, the VC were pretty elusive, though. They didn't stick around. They, they were kind of hard to find. And uh, from what I understand, um, they were just trying to get away from us. But um, generally, this was more of a, a miserable time. The weather was bad. Um, we did move through the area. And um, I don't remember a lot about Harvest Moon, probably because, to me, it wasn't anywhere near like Starlight. And it lasted several days. I think it started around the 9th or so of December and went through the 20th. Uh, I believe that the final body count was uh, like 407 uh, VC NVA killed in action. Of course, that probably is more of an estimate than an actual number. But um, Harvest Moon was <laughs> really miserable. After Harvest Moon, uh, we were coming back um, on a patrol, and I found some metal panji stakes. Now, this, along with some other intelligence helped pinpoint a certain North Vietnamese uh, regiment that had moved into the area. And um, that's what my job was. It was combat intelligence, 
gathering as much information as we could. Now I've kept one of those um, metal pangee stakes, still have it to this day. Uh, the pictures that I'm showing here now are pictures of that I took uh, during that period of time. I think one of the pictures uh, depicts one of the Viet Cong that I had captured uh, is being taken to a helicopter for further interrogation when they get him back. I think uh, a buddy of his is carrying him on his back. You might not be able to see that well in the photo because it was uh, a little ways off. And uh, the other pictures are us coming back, walking down Route 1 and finally getting a ride on a 6 by. Now the Raider platoon had stayed longer um, than the 20th of December in the field. And when we finally made it back, we were on our way to um, our CP tent on the beach. And to our surprise, we came across the Bob Hope Show. <laughs> well, we stopped to listen for a while, and then I got a call on the radio saying, get back here quick. So we couldn't stay for the whole show. But that was kind of interesting. Um, the next day or so, the uh, sappers tried to hit the um, July airstrip. And I remember one Marine who uh, had recently uh, come to Vietnam and he was a guard uh, at the airstrip. He was a black Marine and uh, a sapper had come around the corner of his uh, building that he was standing on, uh, by and he shot this fella and cut him in half with a shotgun. And I remember the next day uh, when I came across him, uh, he was all upset about shooting this sapper. And I said, hey, <laughs> don't be upset about that. Uh, you did a heck of a good job. And I sort of, you know, patted him on the back and made him feel a little better. It was Christmas Eve and I had a patrol uh, right there at the airstrip between the airstrip and uh, uh, the little city of Anton, where the Anton Bridge was. That night, all hell broke loose. Uh, the VC had hit the Anton Bridge. There were four bunkers, uh, two on each side of the, of the river, and um, all night long, just about, there were green tracers flying everywhere and uh, stuff was going off. And we were close by. We were the closest unit uh, to Anton at that time. So I got a, a radio message to go into Anton and check out the situation. So as uh, soon as first light hit, um, I took my squad and we went through Anton and we saw a lot of uh, people crying and you know, a few bodies here and there. And when I got up to the uh, bunkers, uh, there were some Marines that had been killed. Uh, a lot of VC bodies laying around. I crossed the bridge and went into this one bunker on the right hand side and I found my senior drill instructor, uh, Staff Sergeant Castile, he had been in charge of uh, the unit that manned those four bunkers. And they did one heck of a good job. Well, that same day, uh, we were taken to the top of a mountain uh, where we remained there until Operation Double Eagle. But it was, again, miserable. It was raining real hard. 
and it was Christmas Eve, and um, I remember Don Johnson and I, uh, they had hot coffee on top of the hill. It was the first hot coffee we'd seen in days. And I laid down in the mud in my poncho, and um, it was raining, and John went and got us some coffee. He brought it back, and you haven't lived till you felt a real hot cup of coffee in one of those metal canteen cups. You couldn't put it to your lips. You'd burn yourself. So I'm sitting there holding this canteen cup, rain coming down, had my poncho over my helmet, and I couldn't see anything. And uh, then I heard this helicopter land on top of the hill. And I heard these footsteps uh, coming closer in the mud. Then I felt this fella kick me in the bottom of my boot. And he said, Merry Christmas, Marine. Well, I didn't move. I just said to John, I said, John, who in the f you know what I said there, said that. Well, John looked up. He looked down again. He said, General Walt. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> and I heard the general march away and get in his chopper and leave. I'll tell you, it was a miserable <laughs> Christmas Eve. Then the orders came down that we were going to go on another operation. So I sent my team down to uh, check out ammo and grenades and whatnot. And uh, they came back and actually they had more ammo and grenades than they could possibly carry. Now, it just so happened that we had our sea bags and everything with us. So I told the Marines that the um, supply, by the way, had closed and the armory was closed. So we couldn't turn this extra ammo and stuff back. So I told the guys to put the extra grenades, uh, Willie Peter grenades and, and extra ammo, um, you know, machine gun ammo and stuff like that in my sea bag. And I would check it into the armory when we got back. Well, we never got back. <laughs> I'll tell you, this is kind of way ahead of the story, but what happened to that sea bag was really unusual. You see, years later, it ended up on my doorstep. I was a second lieutenant at the time, living in uh, Woodbridge, Virginia, going to uh, the basic school, and I see this sea bag sitting there, and it's my sea bag, it had followed me all those years, and when I opened it up, there they were, white phosphorus grenades, all that ammo, <laughs> nobody checked it. And the funny thing about it was the, the lock wasn't even on it. It was just closed. Well, I forgot to say that uh, when Bob Hope came to Chulai, they lost one engine out of his plane. And uh, he made this comment. He said, other bases here in South Vietnam invited me. This one dared me. <laughs> Well, from that mountain um, that we were stationed on where I packed my sea bag full of ammo, uh, my squad was sent aboard ship as an advance party. I hadn't been briefed yet uh, about our destination, uh, but that was soon to come. And one morning, up a rope ladder came Colonel Bull Fisher. By this time, he was a fool bird colonel. And when he reached the top of the ship and we helped him, John and I helped him aboard, 
he looked over at me and said, Big Bear, how have you been? And I said, fine, sir. Well, he had been uh, promoted to, uh, I think it was regimental commander. And uh, he was aboard our ship. I, I believe we were the flagship. Anyway, we embarked and um, went south. And we made an amphibious landing. When we did, of course, we went over the side uh, on rope ladders. The ocean was a little choppy. I went down as one of the first Marines, and when I got down to the to the um, landing craft, uh, right above me was coming Bayan Kinney. Well, Bayan Kinney accidentally lost grip uh, of the rope, and he fell backwards, and I caught him, and I was still on the rope ladder, and the two of us, then me trying to push him back up where he could get his hands on the ropes again, went between the ship and the landing craft. Uh, we went down between the ship and the landing craft. And I thought well, we could have gotten crushed, both of us. But it just so happened the wave hit just right and he caught his, a grip on the rope and we both made it into the landing craft. Now that was uh, the first thing that happened. Uh, this operation, by the way, was called Double Eagle. And um, we uh, made an amphibious landing and got to the beach. Uh, tanks were already there. And um, so we moved up the beach and uh, set up that night uh, just above where the tanks were. And I remember Marines were having problems they were getting sick of malaria and uh, some of the Marines I lost oh I think one or two Marines out of my own squad with malaria uh, while you're board ship by the way I forgot to mention this I met a corpsman who had the reddest red hair you ever wanted to see uh, he was attached to a different unit and uh, got to know him a little bit, you know, talked with him some. He was new to Vietnam, so told him a few things. And the day after we arrived in Vietnam and uh, I lost those guys from malaria, uh, we set out to go through a village. Now this village had already been gone through by Marines, so we were sort of following up. And I came across a, a hole in the ground. We always check those holes out, you know, for traps and for um, tunnels. But this was just a small hole. When I looked inside, there was a helmet, a Marine's helmet that was face down in the bottom of this hole. So I got back with a long stick and carefully turned over that helmet. Could have been a booby trap, but it wasn't. And when I turned it over and pulled it out of that hole, there was the top of the skull of a red-headed, I think it was that same corpsman that I'd met on board ship because his hair was real red. This was a different part of Vietnam that I had never been in before. There was elephant grass that was taller than I was. Uh, we were getting shot at periodically, but the rounds were over our heads. So it didn't even bother to get down, actually. There were a lot of uh, pangy stakes and, uh, along both sides of the trail and all around this village where we had gone through. We came up to the side of this village and that Marine I told you about earlier that shot the uh, M79 in the ground, almost killed us, walked over to me, tapped me on the shoulder and he said, uh, I think there's a grenade over there. 
Well, I hollered grenade. Everybody got down, and sure enough, grenade went off. Nobody was hit. But I was rather upset with this young Marine who didn't have enough common sense to holler grenade when he saw it. Anyway, we went on, and uh, then I came to another hole in the ground. This was large enough to be a tunnel. Now, there were things that we did when we came across these holes. Uh, a lot of times we uh, didn't have time to get a tunnel rat up. Uh, I was the um, point of the battalion at the time. You never passed one of these. You always took care of it. There could have been something inside. So usually what we did was either drop a smoke grenade or a white phosphorus grenade in the hole, and then you got down and you looked at the horizon. And if you saw smoke coming out from anywhere else, that showed that it was a tunnel and there was a tunnel entrance or exit, and that's where the VC could be. So I took a white phosphorus grenade and I threw it down this hole. And we waited for a while for the uh, smoke to finally subside some. A tunnel rat had come up and he was fixing to check it out. It wasn't a tunnel. It was a bunker. But the first body that that tunnel right throughout was like a three-year-old little girl. Then he threw out the mother. Then he threw out three dead VC. Well, I looked at that child for the longest time. The whole battalion had come past my position. I was just sitting there looking at that dead child. Finally, a Marine came up and he said, look, you couldn't have helped it. You did what you had to do. So he got me going. And uh, we went through that fill. I finally caught up to the rest of my team and took the point. Double Eagle was a series of different long-range patrols. A lot of them were going up the side of a very steep mountain. Um, and on one occasion, uh, this mountain ridge that I went up, we had to get up there quickly. And the heat was just unbearable. The steepness of the hill was tremendous. When we got to the top of this hill, mountain I should say, Don Johnson was bleeding from the mouth and the nose. He was medevaced out of Vietnam at that time. I learned much later that he had uh, punctured a lung somehow, you know, had pinpoint punctures or something. I don't know, but it was caused by exertion, climbing that hill. There were other things that were <laughs> very interesting on that. Uh, operation as we made our way through the jungle and down these jungle uh, trails I ran across elephant traps they were like large pangy stakes but they were made for elephants and I thought that was pretty interesting started to run out of chow and that wasn't unusual for Vietnam. I always ran out of chow. But uh, we came into this other village, and this one area had uh, these large barrels, and they were full of peanuts. So we dipped our uh, hands in the peanuts and put them in our pockets, and that's what we ate for a while, were those peanuts. Uh, we also went from one hot spot to another. Uh, there was one time, like I said, I was the point for the battalion. 
but at this particular time, I was the rear point, or the, the rear guard, you might say, last guy out. Helicopters came down to get us out. Well, the whole battalion had left, and uh, the last choppers had landed, and I went over to get on uh, one of them. And as I was standing beside the chopper, it was an old 34, I was helping my Marines to, to get aboard. There was like, I think there were four or six of us. I forget exactly now. But anyway, I, I was helping them aboard, and I jumped on. Uh, I was the last guy on. And um, I rolled over, and as soon as I did, the gunner that was on the chopper and on this machine gun facing the opposite direction was hit in the shoulder by a round. Now, I didn't know it at the time, uh, but uh, I thought the helicopter had these sparks that were coming from the chopper, but they weren't. They were rounds that were hitting the chopper. And so that helicopter took off. The, the gunner was killed. Uh, chopper took off in the air, went to a different location, and landed in a rice paddy. Well, I rolled off this chopper into the rice paddy and ran toward a, a hill uh, at the edge of the rice paddy. And when I got to the edge of it, there were two um, Vietnamese, it looked like boys. I don't think they were more than 12, 13 years old, but they were boys. They didn't have guns. They weren't armed, as far as I could see. They jumped up right in front of me, and they turned around and ran up the hill away from me. And I looked at them, and they were both wearing bandanas. And the first thing that came to my mind was, uh, these guys are Boy Scouts. Now, I wasn't shy about shooting V.C., but there was no way that I was going to shoot two Boy Scouts running away from me, shoot them in the back. Well, all the other Marines, when I turned around and looked, were all the way on the other side of this rice paddy. The chopper was taking off, and there were no other Marines next to me. So I ran across the rice paddy and joined these Marines. And... You know, we, there was a village there, and um, we walked along the rice paddy dike and uh, made it across. I, I took uh, the point of the battalion again, but I was called back. We were right next to a river, and uh, the colonel requested my presence. Well, when the colonel requests your presence, you're there. So I went back, and... You know, found the colonel, and he asked me if I would swim across this river with a major as, you know, his swimming buddy. Somebody had told the colonel that I was the best swimmer in the battalion. <laughs> so he asked me if I'd swim with him. Of course, I said, yes, sir. So I took off my shirt and my boots and got to the edge of the river. Now, there was a bridge right there that had been destroyed and some of it was cement and the cement columns kind of uh, went out just a little bit from the edge of the river and one marine with a sniper rifle uh, crawled out as far as he could on the edge of that bridge and the major and I swam to the center of the river now what he was supposed to do this major he was from Amtrak's and he was checking the bottom of the river to see if it was uh, suitable to be crossed right there. When we got out, to, there was one cement post that was in the water. And uh, we got out by that cement post. It was about the center of the river. We were way out. That, that river was wide. And there was one hut on the other side of the river. One little grass hut. And when we got to our position, we started taking fire from that grass hut. Some VC was shooting at us. Well, the sniper 
couldn't get a shot from his position and the rounds were hitting the water and uh, the major and I would come up for air and we'd dive down and I saw the rounds flying past my head. Uh, the whole battalion was lined up on the other side of the river and one time when I came up for air I watched a 3.5 rocket flying across the river toward that little grass hut. Well, the little grass hut had one window, and believe it or not, I'll never forget it, that 3.5 rocket went into the window and blew up that little grass hut. Well, the entire battalion cheered. It was the best shot I ever saw in Vietnam. How that guy did that, I'll never know. Anyway, uh, we swam back, and as it turned out, we did not use that um, river to cross there at that point. Well, I took my position back uh, to the front of the battalion, and we went on. Uh, it was, I don't know, maybe one or two days later, uh, we had come down this trail, and uh, it was getting dark. So I set up in a ditch next to the trail, and the Marines came in behind me and set up on both sides of the trail, made their positions, and the whole battalion, you know, hunkered down for the night. Now, you couldn't really walk at night in the jungle. It was best to stop. Anyway... Just after dark, uh, we had settled in, and I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. It was really dark. All of a sudden, I heard a young Marine holler, Halt! Who goes there? I thought to myself at the time, who in the heck would holler, Halt! Who goes there? But I didn't get a chance to think about it very long because the next thing that happened was I heard I heard uh, an explosion I uh, saw tracers flying over my head they were green that meant they were VC and I heard screaming and another explosion and that was about the end of it well I couldn't see anything that night and of course I didn't sleep at all that night, you know, waiting for the assault, whoever was out there. The next morning, I got up out of that ditch, and I went over to the edge of the trail where I found a gunnery sergeant who had uh, set off a Claymore mine. They, they set up this uh, Claymore along the trail. It was a good thing they did. And he had lost an arm. Uh, a young PFC, the young Marine that hollered halt, was dead. And there were a couple of BC bodies laying on the trail. Now, well, the corpsman, of course, came up and he was attending the gun in. Uh, I went up the trail and sat next to this Vietnamese who had been blown up by a claymore. Now, you know, I, I told you I lost a couple of guys in my uh, unit and I had a replacement. So this young Marine that was sitting on the other side of the trail looking kind of green uh, while he was, uh, we, we were supposed to eat breakfast and then go on. So we broke out our sea rations, and uh, this guy was kind of sick. He was, you know, probably first time he'd ever seen a dead body. So I started talking to this dead VC. I was, you know, just shooting a breeze with him, saying, uh, you know, fella, you don't look so good. You know, stuff like that, while I'm eating my chow. And I, you know, set my C-ration can on his chest. 
and uh, you know I'd eat a little bit out of it and stuff like that. And this, this I did this to show this marine that there's nothing to it. Get used to it. Get over it. And so I just kept on going. And after the meal, now I didn't smoke. But after this particular meal, I lit up a cigarette. Now this dead VC, he had one leg like over his left shoulder. He had multiple wounds all around him. His arms were in odd positions and his head was kind of back and his mouth was open just enough. I could see his teeth that I could slip a cigarette between his teeth. And that's what I did. I lit a cigarette and I put a Marlboro between his teeth. It looked like he was smoking a cigarette. So I got my stuff together and we moved on down the trail. And uh, years later, when I was a police officer, I was sitting next to a guy who uh, I later found out was the same Marine that fired that 3.5 a rocket launcher into that um, hut and he told me that there was a, another uh, marine a lieutenant that the whole battalion when they walked past that body and they saw this uh, dead body uh, with a cigarette in his mouth everybody laughed including the colonel but this guy was a lieutenant um, I guess bringing up the rear and he got all upset and he said, who did that? And uh, I'm going to write him up and I'm going to charge him and all this kind of stuff. And somebody told him, well, he's uh, a raider and he's at the head of the battalion if you want him. <laughs> he wasn't about to come up there and get me. Now, we had been several days in this operation. I lost track of time, actually. And we finally made it to the top of this other mountain. Now, this is where we were supposed to run into the Army. The whole idea of Double Eagle was hammer and anvil, where the Marines were the hammer and the Army was supposed to be the anvil. And we were supposed to capture or catch the VC between us. Well, that didn't work out too good. You see, the Army moved with Huey helicopters and we moved on the ground. So the VC simply ran away from us and the army didn't, uh, didn't stop them. But we got to the top of this mountain. We had been several days in the bush. Uh, we didn't have any uh, resupply of chow. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we just ran out of chow. And uh, we were hoping that we get something when we got to the top of this mountain. The Army, on the other hand, flying in their nice Hueys, had cold beer and hot chow. Now, when we got to the top of this mountain, I went over finally after we got our uh, tents set up you know, our little shelter halves. I went over to this one uh, army uh, unit. Uh, they had, by the way, um, set up their their uh, cannons. They had brought in heavy artillery. And I went over to this one unit and I said, darn, I said, you guys don't know. We hadn't had anything cold, you know, at all, no beer, no nothing. Could I get some a beer for, for my, my men over here? And they laughed at me. They thought it was funny. Well, I didn't get the beer. And I just went back without anything. And I think it was the next morning these guys pulled out, took all their equipment, and he loaded out of that place. And so there was a, a little stream where we were, and I 
took, this is the first time I did this in Vietnam. I never left my rifle. I always went with it. Why I left it this time, I couldn't tell you. But I left my rifle and I picked up all these guys' um, canteens and I went down to this creek to fill our canteens. While I'm at this creek, a VC started shooting at me and he unloaded a bunch of rounds that were hitting everywhere except where I was. Then I heard um, the sound of M14s and I realized that uh, the Viet Cong that had shot at me were not shooting at me anymore. So I ran up to my area and got my rifle and I ran up to the top of this um, hill where there were these boulders. And when I, when I came around a boulder, this Marine from, uh, I think he was from Fox Company. I can't remember exactly, Fox or Hotel, I don't remember. But he threw a carbine magazine at me and he said, here, he said, he fired all the rounds out of that one at you. And uh, he was in the process of changing magazines when we came up on him. And there were two dead VC laying in that group of rocks. And you know, I still have that magazine. Well, that was the beginning of that day. Went down, got our shelter halves, got all prepared. And I took up the point for the battalion again, and we walked across this mountain ridge line. And this was the last day of Operation Double Eagle. It, it took us all day to move across this mountain ridge. And down in the rice paddy, you could see them with binoculars. We saw this uh, VC with an elephant and the elephant was carrying uh, what looked like an anti-aircraft gun. So 81 mortars on top of this mountain set up and they started dropping mortars in where this elephant was. The whole battalion's lined up on the, on the ridge line. We're watching this. And it looked like um, a uh, silent movie, you know, from an our gang comedy or something like that. It was funny because the mortar round would uh, hit the uh, by the rice paddy dike. The elephant would turn around and run away. And then another round would hit behind him and he'd turn around and run the other way. And it got to be comical until, of course, the elephant was hit. <laughs> that was the first elephant I'd ever seen get blown up by the 81s. And then uh, we moved along the, the uh, ridge line. And I saw the landing zone, which was right in front of me, basically. It was down the side of this mountain. And I heard that uh, 81s was getting strung out. Uh, they had a lot of heavy equipment to carry. Uh, base plates, mortar tubes, and, you know, the ammo. So they were getting strung out. It was hot. So I sent my Marines, uh, I had two, uh, there were three of us left in my squad, by the way, me and Byron, Kenny, and Mayfield. So I sent Byron, Kenny, and Mayfield back to help 81s, and I stopped, and I waited. Pretty soon they came back with some equipment. I ran back a whole length of the battalion, found 81s, grabbed a 81 base plate, put it up over my shoulder, ran all the way back to the front of the battalion. And then I took up the point again. Then I started walking down to the LZ, the landing zone. As I'm walking down this side of this mountain, there was a lot of shale. It was like shale. I mean, it was hard to walk. I stepped right on a booby trap. First time I'd ever done anything stupid like that in Vietnam. Well, it 
shattered my right ankle, broke my right leg, got caught shrapnel in my hand, and uh, it picked me up and threw me down the mountain. I landed on that 81 base plate. I think that's what saved my life because there were sharp, jagged rocks down there I landed on. The uh, This was a two-part booby trap. It's called a bouncing Betty. The first part of it, and did all the damage. The second part of it then went down the hill and exploded. And uh, I got what was called the wah-wahs out of it. It just stunned me. Fortunately, I didn't get any shrapnel or anything from that thing. But I was in pretty bad shape. I looked back up the uh, mountain and I couldn't see one Marine. <laughs> they had all gotten down where they heard the explosion. And I tell you what, when you're in front of a, a whole battalion of Marines, and you look back and you don't see anybody, you know that these guys were good. The next thing I knew, here comes this young corpsman, and he ran down the hill, and I told him to stop because the worst thing you can do is uh, get a wounded Marine who's just stepped on the mine because it could be other mines in the area, we didn't know, I didn't know. Well, he got down to me, almost stepped on me, and um, I'm laying there, and he looked at me, he looked at my boot, and he took his knife and cut the boot laces on my boot. My ankle swelled up just immediately. There was no way that I was gonna put that boot back on ever. So I'm laying there, and uh, then P.T. Scott came out of nowhere. And he's, he's by my side and he told the corpsman, don't touch him. I guess he was right upset because uh, he knew that the corpsman made a bad mistake uh, cutting my shoelaces like that. And so the whole battalion then went past my position down to the LZ. We weren't real far away, but we were uh, far enough away. The um, battalion commander had already uh, called in um, naval gunfire to hit where we had been. And where we had been was where I was. So P.T. Scott, he knew I couldn't walk. He grabbed me and threw me over his shoulder and carried me with all our equipment down the side of that mountain to the LZ. Well, they put me on the first chopper that left that area. I was due to rotate back to the States, I thought. Well, I was going to rotate back to the States all right, but it wasn't the way I thought I was going to go. I was medevaced to Da Nang, and they put me in an amputee ward. I thought I was going to lose my right leg. Then they put me uh, in another uh, aircraft, and I was supposed to be sent to Japan for an operation. But as it was, they put me on a, a plane that had guys that already had lost a limb. And I ended up in the Philippines. Well, when I got to the Philippines, uh, they saw that uh, I had been misshipped. So instead of sending me to Japan, uh, they sent me to Hawaii. Now, you have to understand, I'd been in the bush for over a month. No shower, no shave, no nothing, no hot water. The only thing I had with me at the time uh, was a uh, K-bar and that um, carbine magazine I think I had in my pocket. So when 
When I got to Hawaii, uh, out comes General Kulak. Now, you could smell me a lot sooner than you could see me. And uh, General Kulak was walking along the airstrip there, and he saw me laying there in the stretcher. Oh, by the way, they had uh, pumped me full of morphine or something. I was really out of it for a few days. But I remember uh, General Kulak jumping down the throat of this poor Army nurse uh, when he saw me. And he, he didn't know the whole story, but he thought that, you know, I should have been taken better care of. Well, they took me to Tripler Hospital in Hawaii, and uh, they were going to take my K-bar away from me. And I said, no you're not going to touch my K-bar. Well, by the time I got to Tripler, my ankle had started to unswell, which was a good sign. And they never put a cast on my leg. I remember laying in the Tripler hospital, and this guy comes along with a tray of donuts, and hot coffee. He was from the Red Cross. And he said, would you like a donut? I said, I haven't had a donut in two years. And he said, oh, that would be a buck fifty. I said, what? <laughs> he said, you got to donate to the Red Cross. I said, you can keep your donuts. That was my little experience with the Red Cross. They shipped me out of Tripler, and I ended up in a Air Force Hospital in California. And then from there, uh, I was getting better. I was almost ambulatory. I could limp around a little bit. And then they sent me to Philadelphia Naval Hospital. When I got to uh, Philadelphia, I only weighed like 140 pounds. I had had malaria myself, didn't know it. I was pretty sick. And I didn't have any uniforms, I didn't have any records. I didn't have anything. So they made me a Lance Corporal again. <laughs> and uh, kind of getting ahead of the story here. I don't want to get into Philadelphia. All I wanted to do here is talk about 2-4. But the last thing I'll say about 2-4 is this. They were the best Marines that I ever had the honor to serve with. When I got out of the hospital in Philadelphia, I was stationed there at the Navy Yard was ambulatory. I got a letter from a friend of mine who found out where I was. And I learned in that letter that Brian Kenny and Mayfield were both killed. Mayfield had hit a booby trap and it killed both of them. So that was the last two guys out of my squad. There was another friend of mine, the guy that wrote the letter actually, who had won several medals, Bronze Star, Silver Star. And he did it by being on a side of a mountain where the Viet Cong had decided to attack at night. He was manning a machine gun and instead of opening up with his machine gun that would really have uh, exposed his position, he simply reached down to help these guys up the hill. And he reached down and grabbed a guy's hand and pulled him up and stabbed him in the back and grabbed another one and kept on doing this until he had at least a dozen uh, around his position that he had <laughs> stabbed every one of them. <laughs> like Colonel Fisher once said, who's the best in the Corps? Two, four. Well, 
here I am at Gettysburg 53 years later. I'm thinking about all those men that fought in this conflict 150 years ago. The ones that lost legs and arms and the ones that ended up with what they used to call soldier's heart. Yeah, I know about soldier's heart. They call it PTSD today. Anyway, when I think back on the time I stepped on the booby trap at Bouncing Betty, I could have lost my leg. I was injured pretty good. They did want to take my right leg off. I was scheduled for an amputation. I know it was by God's grace that that didn't happen. Of course, later on, because I was in such bad shape, you know, only weighing 145 pounds and had several injuries that were not really attended to and that were healing up on their own. They were trying to decide on whether or not I would receive a medical discharge. I fought that medical discharge with all I had. I had to prove to the doctors in Philadelphia and the ones in charge of the Navy Yard that I could still be a Marine and still perform all of the duties that I had to. I had to be better than the best. So I maxed my physical fitness tests and proved to the Marine Corps that I was still worthy. Of course, later on, I became a drill instructor, and after that, I got my commission and became an officer. Still, I'll always remember all those that I served with in 2-4. We were tight. We were disciplined. We were highly trained, well motivated, and highly experienced. The second battalion, fourth Marines, will remain in my heart forever.